Whether it's gross dishes or contestants who are done dirty, here's a look at some of the dirtiest moments from MasterChef of all stripes. Let's get started with this contestant, who never expected what was coming for him. MasterChef is full of unexpected twists. Take what happened during Tamar's audition, for instance. Or hell, what followed after. And that was just one of the times it was made abundantly clear that we've gotta expect the unexpected on MasterChef. After reconsidering, I think that you're deserving it. Let's get things started with this contestant, who never expected what was coming for him. To be great. Will you accept that offer? Yeah, I'm talking about Gabriel from season eight. If episode 16 of that season aimed to make everyone emotional, well, they nailed it. Now, talking about the challenge, the home cooks had to make pasta from scratch, something that's far harder than it sounds on paper. All gonna need to make one of those incredible fresh pastas from scratch. But Gabriel really went all out, and you could see his dedication shining through what he presented. Despite being a complete novice at this, Gabriel was confident. And for once, it wasn't in a cocky way. When it came to the preparation, everything seemed to be going well. But what happened when that dish hit the plate shattered Gabriel's confidence. The judges, unfortunately, were far from impressed with what he managed to put together. This is not what it's supposed to look like. When it was Ramsay's turn to provide feedback, he went so far as to compare it more to lasagna than the cannelloni it was trying to be. As for the taste, well, the filling lacked flavor, the sauce was overly sweet. All in all, the entire dish was a flop to end all flops. No shocker that Gabriel got the boot, even in spite of how well he'd been doing overall. But Gabriel believed in himself, and the judges also saw his potential. All he needed was a bit of polishing. And guess who pitched in to help him out? Ramsay and Daron. The two judges were so impressed by his dedication that they wanted to help him advance his career. I am personally gonna send you to culinary school. Now that was totally unexpected, for sure. Ramsey wasn't willing to let such talent slip away. And he knew exactly how to give Gabriel a boost. I mean, I can only imagine how overwhelming it must have been for him. Likewise, Arone wasn't too far behind as well. He extended an offer for Gabriel to join his New Orleans restaurant. Surely with this opportunity, Gabriel had a genuine shot at a future in the culinary world. And it wasn't solely because of his exceptional cooking skills, but also because of his genuinely nice personality. Many viewers chimed in to encourage Gabriel after his elimination. Some said he was a good contender for his age and didn't really do anything bad until this cannelloni. They also lauded Ramsey and Sanchez for offering him a chance to grow in the culinary world. And that just went to show how much potential he really had. Well, Gabriel is one of those few contestants who left MasterChef smiling despite being eliminated. Uh, let me just brush that mediocre season 12 performance of his under the rug here real quick. Anyway, not everyone gets to share in the same luck Gabriel had. I'm talking about, hey, wouldn't you know it, season 12. It's almost like I planned it which pitted veteran and junior contestants against each other. This time, their mission was no piece of cake. The contestants had to cater to the appetites of the U.S. Coast Guard. Imagine the pressure. Each team had to whip up a hearty meal for over 100 people. And the fact that they were hungry service people only made it more daunting. The blue team featured seasoned cooks from seasons one through seven, going head to head with the red team, composed of the relatively less tenured cooks from seasons eight through 11. Alejandro took charge of the red team, while Christian did the same for the blue team. The stakes were sky high, and the end was certain, as it usually is. Someone from the losing team was destined for elimination. So the red team launched with stakes, but hold on. Turns out, Ramsey caught wind that they were dishing out cold cut. That's bloody table. The tray's cold, the steak's cold. Not exactly the sizzling start they had in mind. 
Predictably, Ramsey wasn't thrilled. He ordered them to crank up the heat and, in a crazy turn of events, shifted the Coast Guard over to the blue team so they'd actually get fed. They'd get fed over at the blue team, right? Right? Oh boy. Got it. Got we, it. We, we need mash. We have it's no coming. mash. Oh my god. The mashed potatoes were apparently still cooking. The only thing they were actually producing was Ramsey's anger. But despite the dumpster fire of a start both teams had, the initial feedback from the diners was surprisingly positive for both the teams. But when Ramsey was faced with yet another raw steak being served to the Coast Guard, he drove home exactly how unacceptable it was in no uncertain terms. Come on, give me a plate. But Alejandro was unfazed by Ramsey's unique spin on surf and turf. He scooped up some fallen steaks, tossed them back onto the grill, and voila! He was good to go! They're gonna get cooked. But the real shocker, he defended it, claiming what he did killed bacteria. And while he may have technically been right, it was the principle of the matter for Ramsey. And it was also on principle that Ramsey did this. The captain, you better have a meeting right now and right. sort this Well, here's hoping that the new boss will do a bit better than the old boss. Many viewers couldn't believe that Alejandro of all people was called back for another season. And on top of it, he made it to the top four, which is even crazier. And yeah, I'm totally with the peanut gallery on this one. Whether or not Ramsey actually wanted him on, that's not for me to say. But thank God he didn't end up winning either of his seasons, I'll tell you that much. On to the next. I never expected that this next home cook was even capable of putting out bad food. In season 4 episode 4, the top 19 contenders were waiting for the other shoe to drop after the mystery box challenge was over. They were so curious to find out more about the dish for the elimination challenge. But before that could happen, the mystery box winner, Natasha, earned the privilege of being the first to explore the MasterChef pantry. It's the chance to be in control of everybody else's destiny. Meanwhile, there was a plot twist cooking up. Natasha not only got the pantry power, but also became the architect of the elimination test, selecting the dish or style that would challenge each and every contestant. Their fates were in her hands. However, the theme of the challenge itself was a secret weapon wielded by the judges and the judges alone. We gave you the most basic of ingredients. While Joe brought a taste of European flair with langoustine, Graham unveiled any chef's dream. Sans vegetarian. That's always on the menu at the world's finest restaurant. A first cut veal chop. A staple in the world's finest restaurants. And then there was Ramsey. Who had managed to get his hands on the rare Stilton Blue Cheese? A delicacy only produced by five farms worldwide. And believe me, it would be the end of any chef's career if they ruined an ingredient that prestigious. However, since she had the advantage, there was one thing Natasha didn't have to worry about. Would be able to cook something amazing with one of these ingredients? Not all of them, no. Yeah. If I were in her shoes, I'd be breathing a huge sigh of relief right there. I don't think I'd be able to live with myself if I screwed up any of those ingredients. Still though, she had the power to orchestrate the way the competition was gonna go. And guess who she gave the most difficult dish to? Is she competition? Yep, I kinda saw that coming considering they didn't exactly have much of a friendship. I mean, that's one way to punish Chrissy, and Natasha was unforgiving about it. As for the other cooks, Natasha went for the langoustine. The decision definitely made Chrissy's blood boil, but it was time for her to show her rival what she was capable of. But the twist was far from over. The judges then let Natasha pull her third move. Now get to choose. One more person. Natasha held the key to save any one contestant, and she decided to save Savannah, and not out of love, only because she'd be easier to beat later on down the line. Cold. Anyway, let's now cut to the challenge, where Sasha stole the spotlight from Chrissy and Natasha. 
Ramsay took one look at Sasha's dish and... Hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself here. What exactly did Sasha present? Langoustine on top of cheese grits. Something Ramsay was finding difficult to understand even from a conceptual basis. Boot on the plate, what is that? That is the langoustine on top. Now, it'd be one thing if Sasha ruined a whole lot of langoustine, but where in the hell was it? After a bit of detective work, Ramsey finally spotted it. And spoiler alert, Sasha might have bitten off more than she could chew. Literally. On top of the cheese grits. Ramsey delivered the final verdict. The combination is just all wrong. Not exactly a standing ovation, huh? Now, it was time for Joe's verdict, but before he even tried the dish, he hit Sasha with probably the most reasonable question he's ever asked on the show. I was with a langoustine, and you give me this? Sasha was caught off guard, but tried to keep her cool. This is probably worth 55 cents. Yeah, even I could tell that this wasn't exactly the most opportune moment for a joke. And Joe wasn't amused. Not that he'd be amused even when the stakes were as low as possible. Thanks for nothing. He skipped the tasting altogether. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you where it ended up, but I will anyway. It took a one-way trip to the trash can. And, well, so did her MasterChef journey. Yeah, I don't think there was any coming back from that nightmare of a dish. But while there was so much more Sasha could have done with her concept, what this next contestant brought to the table was totally unexpected. You single-handedly will take out anybody. Thank you, Chef. Now, this one is too good to miss, so make sure to watch till the end. As a primer, this little story features the MasterChef Season 3 winner, the incredibly talented, visually impaired chef, Christine Ha, at her lowest point on the show. But it ended up being so incredibly beautiful. So Christine made a relatively rare appearance in a pressure test. I'm feeling disappointed and to think that I have to go into a pressure test after- And guess what was on the menu? Apple pie. Something that a visually impaired chef like Christine was gonna have a pretty tough time nailing. Visually, I'm at a disadvantage, but I know I need to still put that pie together. It was heartbreaking to see her fearing elimination, even knowing what we know now about where her journey went. Despite her lack of confidence, Christine didn't let it hold her back. Now, here's the kicker. All contestants had to whip up the same thing with the same ingredients. The only game changer was that they needed to figure out a way to add something special to stand out from the pack. And they'd need to do it in the one hour and 15 minutes they had on the clock. But as time passed, the pressure only rose and rose. Oh, Cindy, did I cut myself? Am I bleeding? Medic. It's no wonder Christine became a nervous wreck. The atmosphere was thick with stress. The judges weren't oblivious either. They knew that Christine would face a unique challenge once those pies hit the oven. It wasn't like she was going to be able to feel, smell, or taste her way into knowing whether the bottom crust was set, or if the top was golden brown enough. And that was exactly what was running through Christine's mind. I'm gonna have to rely on Cindy to tell me the color of the crust and then just try to time it. But Christine, despite all the challenges she faced, including a cut to the finger even, was literally giving it her all. Now, here comes the judge's dilemma, as they harbored doubts, but still wished the best for her. If those apples are delicious, then that's half the battle. With a mere 40 minutes left on the clock, it was time for the pies to hit the oven. But the worst thing happened to Christine at the worst possible moment. Oh, I broke. There's no way. I just don't have any more flour. With her dough in pieces, Christine was in a pretty tight spot. Since she had run out of flour to make more, she had to turn to another contestant for a lifeline. In the end, she somehow scrambled to work on the pie all over again from scratch. As time was running out, doubts started creeping in about whether she could pull it off. Felix, do you have extra flour? Here you go. Thank you. But this is where Christine's resilience started to shine through. Again, even while facing more and more intense challenges coming her way, she didn't throw in the towel. Instead, she dug deep. 
and whipped up a new pie in record time. But she wasn't gonna be able to feel or taste it. She was literally taking a blind leap of faith here. And when time ran out, Christine found herself in the spotlight for the final judgment. First of all, I've never seen you that flustered. And then, with barely 18 minutes to go, you still were not in the oven. Despite her visual impairment, her apple pie looked nothing short of amazing. Not that she knew that though. Ramsey stepped in to boost her morale, urging her to stop doubting herself. It's got a nice, crisp, dark brown color on the edge. Now, the moment of truth arrived, and it was time to taste the pie. It's delicious. So well done, okay? Congratulations. Now, the crazy part was that Christine didn't just impress. She blew everyone away. Like, listen to how the crust sounds. Can you hear that on top? Yes, Chef. What does that sound like to you? It sounds good and crusty. Delicious, right? In the end, Ramsay was moved more by the flavors of the dish than Christine's tears, and she undoubtedly deserved every bit of appreciation she got. During a Reddit AMA where Christine was open to questions from her fans, one of them asked what was running through her mind when she was making that pie? How did she know it was done? Well, in reply, Christine mentioned that the whole time during the cook, she was laughing, saying to herself that her pie was a clusterfuck. Christine thought she was going home that day, and also thought of giving up early. She continued by saying that she had no idea that the pie was done. She shoved it in the oven 18 minutes before time was up, and just cranked it up to 450 degrees Fahrenheit or something, and then she pulled it out seconds before Ramsey counted down. Well, call it luck or divine intervention, but a great apple pie is still a great apple pie at the end of the day. But this next incident was a rare moment on MasterChef. Two rival contestants ended up growing, changing, and bettering themselves together. So I'm talking about season five, when contestants got the scoop that the upcoming team challenge involved working in pairs. When asked about his least preferred teammate, Leslie wasted no time throwing Aran's name into the ring. I'll give you three guesses who he ended up with. Well, this is where things started to get interesting. Courtney, the reigning champ and puppet master of the pairings, held the power to pick the team. Much to Aran's dismay, she found herself paired with Leslie, the last person she wanted to work with too. Well, at least they agreed on something. Back in the pantry, Leslie agreed to go along with whatever Aran wanted. And cooperation was the last thing she expected from her teammate. But their story didn't start and end there. Fast forward to the pressure test in episode 12, and the contestants were faced with a prawn triple threat challenge. They had to serve them ceviche, tempura, and butterfly. But here's the kicker. Only one contestant would make it out alive. Ron found herself in a tight spot, especially considering the prawns she needed to handle were live. Surprisingly, Leslie took a humble turn as the pressure test unfolded. I'm just as nervous as the people behind me. They're just as good. I don't underestimate them. I just gotta beat them. Now, as the pressure cranked up, Iran started to crumble. I'm really stressed right now. You can do this. <laughs> Tears were just about ready to start flowing as the fate of these contestants hung in the balance. Now, this is when Ramsey decided to step in. He tried to pep Aran up, reminding her of her accomplishments and urging her to push through the pressure test. I think we've done this competition so far. Yeah. Okay. I rely on that palette like you have done so far. When the tasting came around, Leslie's dishes managed to impress the judges, but Aran's dishes, if the preamble I gave them was any indication, didn't fare nearly as well. Too much liquid, too almost pickled because of the vinegar. Okay. In the end, the final judgment came down to Leslie and Aran, two contestants who were at each other's throats not too long ago but somehow managed to form an unexpected bond the further they got into the competition together. Anyway, the verdict was inevitably going to send one of them home, separating the two for the rest of the season. No doubt everyone was on the edge of their seats, because I sure was. This is a tale of our uh, eldest versus our youngest. And now, you might need to go ahead and grab some tissues before watching the rest of this video. Leslie's heartfelt words definitely aren't for the faint of heart. I did not expect to grow the way I have been growing and to work out my differences with this young lady. Sadly, Iran had to bid adieu to Leslie and the rest of the gang. 
Yeah, there was no doubt he was going to be the one walking out of that decision to cook another day. But Iran didn't leave without sharing a few heartfelt words of her own. Who's going to win MasterChef? <laughs> Leslie. Love you, girl. Wow. Iran graciously acknowledged Leslie's potential and even predicted he was going to be the one to take home the title. Even in hindsight, knowing he was unfortunately the runner-up to the runner-up, third place for those of you keeping score at home, it still really warms my heart to hear her say that. People have said that Iran should have stayed over Leslie and that she was a real front-runner in spite of her relatively younger age compared to everyone else that season. MasterChef can definitely get a bit silly sometimes. Sometimes it's the contestant's fault, and sometimes the judges pick a really weird way to show up on set. Today, I'm talking about the most ridiculous moments I could think of. Like this time from season 12, when things took a pretty nasty turn for pretty much everybody involved. So what happened is, right at the start, the contestants were given a pretty exciting challenge. Those amazing cowboys and cowgirls, you'll be feeding all of them and the hardworking people of this town. The challenge took them to a real rodeo where they had to cook for actual cowboys and cowgirls. Most of them hadn't even been to a rodeo before, but MasterChef gave them a front row seat to the action. And moreover, the judges suited up as cowboys too. And I haven't even gotten to the actual absurd part yet. Gordon looking like Woody. Well, team challenges are the judges' all-time favorite. If there's ever a chance to step up and prove yourself, it's in a team challenge. But if the theme wasn't already challenging enough, let's take a look at the captains for the day. Bree and Shelly, both of you will be team captains. Yay! Yep. Given that they were both in the bottom two just a week prior, this was an interesting move to say the least. In that week, Bree and Shelly had to show why they deserved to stick around. Bree took over the red team, while Shelly led the blue team. But here comes the fun part. As far as picking the teams, both of you are going to pick them yourselves today. Considering they were at the bottom, this was a perfect opportunity to shore up their chances. Shelly went for some familiar faces from her last team challenge, while Bree went with folks she thought could create magic together. Leading was going to be a double-edged sword, though. Bree had some experience as a team leader before, and she wanted to repeat the success. But, well, both of them were smart, picking strong chefs for their teams. So it could honestly go either way. One thing's for sure, though. They'd need to make sure that one voice rang out above all the others, the head chefs. Anyway, let's take a look at the menu. You've got a beautiful selection of bone-in steaks. Now, Brie wasn't much of a yeller. Fantastic for likability, but it had a downside. Do you want me to help with sweet potatoes? Brie. Brie. Gosh. And even the judges were concerned if she'd be able to assert herself and take control. She'll need to step up, take control of her team. Eventually, her team went for a barbecue dish. But that's when Ramsey noticed Dara struggling and decided to step in. Bree, if I was running this team, I'd get supported here first. Open up. As soon as he asked for someone to help her out with the coleslaw, things got really intense. The teams had machines, so they didn't really need two pairs of hands for coleslaw duty. Additionally, with over a hundred hungry mouths to feed, time was of the essence. But just when he thought everything was back on track, the blue team started spiraling. Shelly hit a snag with one of her chefs. Check the temp, Christian, please. That's a disrespect if you poke at me. She thought teaming up with Christian would be a good call, but the idea backfired, big time. Christian was intent on being as argumentative as possible, especially when it came to checking the temperature of his meat. Come on now, I've cooked hundreds and hundreds of steaks. He claimed he had it under control and didn't need to bother taking the time to do it. But Shelly managed to convince him. Cook a million steaks. What's the temp you going for? You're going 120. Medium rare, yeah. Little did she know, though, Christian was venting in his confessional, suggesting Shelly should be more open to different viewpoints. The irony? When Christian was the captain, he did the opposite, picking everything, refusing to listen, and yelling to keep things in order. Well, clearly Shelly didn't want to go down that road, and Christian was taking advantage of it. Who's placing what here? Steak is last. I know, Steak. who's doing what? Who is 
doing what? And then, Shelly gave some really unnecessary advice to Brandy. Make it taste like barbecue sauce. Barbecue baked beans. Just for a little bit of perspective, even Willie found it pretty weird. You don't want to make the beans too sweet. But they were running out of time, and Ramsey had to do something about it. Taste, taste. I did. I didn't see you taste that one. Well. You just dumped his sugar in there. But she figured that arguing and just generally being a huge problem was the perfect response. <sighs> don't argue. Just listen okay. to what I'm saying. Yes, chef. Well, how did the dish turn out? Brandy. Yes, chef. Just taste those beans. They're way too sweet. Brandy felt like a fool, caught between Shelly's advice and Ramsay's expectations, and this led to Brandy complaining as loudly as she could while working with the cabbage. They pulled me off to finish Willie's beans. On the other hand, Shelly was taking a million years to get her coleslaw together. How do we have the steak ready and no slaw now? As if that wasn't enough, Christian did something crazy. Blue team raw. Completely. Boo. On the inside. Safe to say, Ramsey wasn't having the best day. Oh. Come on. So, to make a long story short, Shelly ended up assigning the wrong people to the wrong stations. Like, Christian refusing to check the steak's temperature should have been a clear signal that she should have gone in a different direction for the meat station. Meanwhile, Derek, Christian's red team counterpart, watched the turmoil go down from the sidelines. And well, if that wasn't motivation to cook every piece of his meat to perfection, I don't know what is. And that's exactly what he did. She made me look like an idiot, and I just served it back to her. But as he was cruising through the challenge, Derek saw Shelly's mismanagement as karma, especially since he believed he wasn't picked for her team for personal reasons. In his eyes, she deserved whatever challenges came her way. Now, despite the blue team managing to pull things together towards the back half of service, was it enough? Well, the answer to that question lay in the hands of the cowboys and cowgirls. Yeah, it'd be a waste of time if I tried to hide it. The red team pulled out the win with zero trouble. However, the blue team's defeat meant that the judges had to narrow in on one person to show the door. And nobody fit the bill better than Shelly. Remember, she'd been in the bottom three in the last challenge, and the blue team's failure ultimately came down to her leadership, or the lack thereof. Still, it was a shock seeing the hammer being dropped so suddenly. But if you thought that was crazy, what happened in Season 4's second Mystery Box Challenge was even worse. This time, they were working with some Japanese classics. Black cod, black and white sesame seeds, baby beets, shiitake mushrooms, and a bunch more relatively exotic stuff. We'd be here all day if I named every individual item, but the most important part of the challenge, as usual, lay at the very end. The winner would get a massive advantage in the next round. But guess what? There was one dish that stood out from all the others. One dish stood out as appalling. Enter Howard Simpson, the man who had the guts to serve sashimi to the judges. Howard, bring that dish up. But Ramsey wasn't impressed. He straight up told him that the fish looked raw as heck, and it didn't even break properly. I mean, come on. If you're gonna serve sashimi, you should at least, like, make actual sashimi, not whatever the hell that was. Oh, but here's the most surprising part. You won't believe what Joe did after checking out Howard's dish. And these kind of dishes are what sends you home. Yeah. If you didn't catch my sarcasm, I think that's gonna be the most obvious thing that happens in this video. Like, leave a comment if you didn't think it was going straight into the trash. Now, fast forward to the elimination round, and Howard had a shot at redemption with some admittedly amazing cupcakes. But was it enough to save him from the chopping block? Well, there's no better place to start than with Joe's reaction. It's a nice, very kind of um, a light and airy cake. Yeah, a rare glimpse at Joe's good side. He couldn't help but give props to those cupcakes. Guess Howard's baking skills were on point that night. Good job, Howard. Thank you. And when Ramsay had a taste, his reaction was pure gold. Cooked to perfection. I mean, what more can I say? What a redemption arc, and all in one episode, too. Good job. Thank you. Well done. I really love it when MasterChef channels the great British Bake Off's good vibes. And Howard was really feeling overwhelmed by the tonal whiplash he got served up this episode. It's 
good to be back on top. But while Howard managed to pull off the comeback of the century and cried all the tears that come with it, one dish can still be enough to torpedo your entire MasterChef journey. And this next contestant learned this lesson the hard way. And the challenge you face tonight, the biggest risk. I want to take a look at Season 10, Episode 8's Team Challenge, with Michael and Nick stepping into the roles of blue and red team captains, respectively. And let's check out what their mission was for the day. We'll have to learn how to make a gourmet. They had to master a gourmet three-course meal at Joe's Signature Restaurant in Los Angeles. But here's the catch. We'll then have to come back here and teach the entire team. Yeah, they were definitely up against a really tough one today, with the captains having to absorb every detail and relay it back to their teams. No recipes allowed. But before long, the challenge kicked into high gear. First is a pasta course, the ricotta and egg raviolo with brown butter and sage. Every chef had to nail a single raviolo while keeping the egg perfectly runny. Next up was a lamb rack in tahini and dried Persian lime marinade. And the contestants got busy taking note of every last detail. Tahini, coriander, and smoked paprika. Again, they didn't have the luxury of a recipe, just secondhand memories from their captains. Yes, we are going to do the sea trout with the Umbrian lentils. Believe me, each dish demanded nothing short of perfection. Season 10 really wasn't pulling any punches. First time I've actually felt really stressed in this competition. Needing to remember both the look and taste of the dishes, both captains opted out of cooking, which was a pretty smart move. But with only one hour to prepare three dishes for each course, they'd need to make sure all nine of their dishes were immaculate. With stations divvied up, some contestants rose to the occasion, showcasing their ability to handle pressure, while others started to crumble. Now, I want to focus on Sam here. He found himself in charge of the trout after Michael entrusted him with the task. But Sam kicked things off by deciding to go rogue, opting for a stainless steel pan instead of the cast iron recommended by Michael. Despite Michael's explicit request to switch to cast iron, Sam stuck to his guns. No, 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 no. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know, Michael, you gotta trust me. I know exactly what I'm doing. Sam's confidence came more from arrogance than skill. That's for sure. Nothing was gonna sway him from his stainless steel choice. But I mean, why pick that hill to die on? And Sam kept refusing and refusing to change things up. Michael had to do something about it before the insubordination completely broke his authority. Crispy. Sam, you didn't listen to me. I don't know if it's ego or what his problem is. So Michael sought another teammate willing to use cast iron. Two of them done. Get those pans roaring. They're already on. They're already on. With that situation sort of dealt with, he turned his attention to the pasta station. Unfortunately, despite his hands-on effort, the butter just would not get browned enough. Is our butter browned enough? And Michael's intense focus on the pasta left the other stations neglected. Michael's not even gonna have a chance to look at the other two dishes. This is a big mistake. When judgment time arrived, the pasta dishes took center stage. Come on, get it on there. But the blue team wasn't able to pull off a miracle. The pasta was as bad as it looked. However, Michael took responsibility for it acknowledging that his decision to make the ladies wait played a significant role in the way things went. Safe to say, repercussions were gonna be coming their way at some point. So my egg's undercooked. It's a shame because we've got the finesse. On the other hand, the red team nailed the pasta, but stumbled with the lamb instead. And centerpiece and other, was that your idea? No, that was fine. Well, Katura insisted the lamb was fine, but as Nick wasn't assertive enough, they ended up losing that round. As for the blue team, well, the shoe was finally on the other foot. It's on point. Touch less cooking on the broccolini for me. Now, time for the final dish. And the trout sealed the deal for the red team with a flawless setup. Meanwhile, the blue team, um, let's not even go there. Trust me on this one. The lentils are cooked poorly. It's like a lentil soup that you would sell for two bucks. But here comes yet another charged episode from season seven. So in episode four, season six finalist Nick Nappy stepped back into the MasterChef kitchen and got the top 18 contestants to cater his wedding day. Nick Nappy. Oh my God. Yeah. 
Another wedding catering concept. I'm just gonna say it now. Disaster is always inevitable for these sort of challenges. And the twist wasn't gonna make things any better. Expensive, elegant protein, but you overcooked those scallops. Nick and his fiance were uncompromising when it came to selecting the protein. So saith the bride and groom. The blue and red team shalt cook scallops for appetizers and racks of lamb for the main course. <clears throat> The real challenge, however, was the team selection process. Nathan and Terry took on the roles of team captains, but Nathan was catching a ton of weird look. Wow, Nathan, we have five. I mean, I get it, the dude was 20 years old, so doubting his leadership skills doesn't seem too crazy an idea. But unfortunately for him, not many were eager to join his team, meaning that a significant number of contestants attempted to join Terry's side. However, the judges weren't gonna stand by and let a 17v1 team competition play out. <laughs> this challenge will be cooked by two, even teams of nine. Uh, but here's the thing. Now, Terry, with a surplus of options, had the challenging task of deciding who he wanted on his team. In a strategic move, Terry believed these contestants might pose challenges down the road. Send DeAndre over. Wow, DeAndre, wow. You must be wondering, why Sean? Well, I'll let Terry speak for himself. Sean is a strong contender. Sean is an amazing homie. Smart move. And just like he expected, Terry's concerns about Sean proved valid when, on the blue team, Sean's assertiveness clashed with Nathan at every turn. But this first. Yeah, let's do this Please, guys. Let's do a blood orange vinaigrette with the- He was adamant about bulldozing over Nathan as much as he could. I like the idea of the blood orange vinaigrette. And what did Sean have to say for himself? I don't think Nathan's ever had a leadership role before. Well, the blue team quickly found themselves in disarray. It was clear that nobody was happy with how things were going. Hey, listen to me, guys. I need that sauce. I'm straining it right now. I need it now. However, Sean's performance at the helm wasn't a significant improvement because Sean faced his own set of challenges when attempting to delegate tasks among the team. Barbara was a recurring issue. When the team had an issue, you better believe Barbara was at the center of it. Now, guess what she was up to even before the ceremony started? Why are we cooking all these scallops now? Yep, exactly. Cooking the scallops before the wedding ceremony led to Nathan completely losing control. And we're gonna win this damn competition. Uh, pull this off, put it back there in a bowl. I mean, I get why they wanted to shift the leadership to Sean, but Nathan was worried more about himself than his team. I need you to stop. Nathan, watch out. Look, come here, look at me. Nathan found himself running around arguing with literally everybody on his team, but especially Sean. And the dude reached his limit real quick. Nathan, and guess what? Barbara was back with a new string of mishaps. Who could have guessed, right? Seriously? Oh my gosh. I mean, it was almost comical how badly she was screwing up. So while the blue team was completely imploding, the red team faced a different sort of challenge. And we're running into problems with the burners going out. Who would have thought that the wind was gonna be an issue? But I mean, considering everything they placed on the table was blown away, I'd call that an issue. Oh, no! Ah! Red team, come on! Now the focal point shifted to the team's ability to improvise and find solutions on the spot. And this is what they plan to do with Ramsey's help. Got it, I've got it. Cloths. Terry made a strategic move by removing all the tablecloths, a decision made in no small part due to Ramsey's observation. And fortunately, the red team managed to finally rally after they figured that out. Meanwhile, the blue team was still struggling. Their scallops had a back order list a mile long. Guys, this scallop is wrong! Considering how little they bothered even talking to each other, I can't say that I'm surprised. Nathan's approach of raising his voice to be heard backfired. Even if they hadn't been more attentive when he spoke in a more measured tone, a bunch of people felt demeaned by the yelling. 
After falling short with their appetizers and missing the window before speeches began, the blue team was granted an opportunity for redemption with the main course. Recognizing the need for a change in tactics, Nathan adjusted his approach, opting for a calmer demeanor this time around. So bring it down a little bit. You know, I got a little team captain happy. I did it's not sorry. mean to it's yell. Okay. It's okay. It's right. However, DeAndre was really uncomfortable about being questioned about the Orzo. But I mean, he really should have taken the note in stride, because the Orzo practically went up in flames like two seconds afterwards. In a desperate attempt to salvage the situation, he sought Ramsey's help. Yeah, the blue team was really struggling. And unfortunately for them, it didn't get much better. But more on that later, because in the meantime, the red team decided to serve their racks of lamb completely raw. Ramsey ended up raising his voice for the very first time, which as scary as it probably is being on the receiving end of that, they better be glad they weren't on Hell's Kitchen. But the root of the problem turned out to be how a bunch of them had noticed the issue, but chose not to speak up to avoid slowing down the service. But I mean, dropping raw meat on people's tables was gonna slow things down even more. In spite of that though, the red team ultimately walked away with the victory. As for the blue team, I mean, come on. After every issue that I talked about them running into, they'd need to pull off an insane comeback to even have a ghost of a chance. From jaw-dropping challenges to unexpected twists, these are some of MasterChef's most insane moments ever. And what better way to kick off the list than by discussing a contestant that had a really foul mouth. Yep, no points for guessing. I'm talking about Chrissy from season four. So things got pretty heated in episode 23, during the mystery box challenge, when she got paired up with Jessica. And Jesse, for all the right reasons, wasn't too happy about it. Nightmare just happened right before my eyes. No denying that. Chrissy was probably one of the most hated people on the show, and the hate was far from unfounded. It's not news that everyone found it hard to be around her. Mean, nasty, and definitely not the type to take accountability. That's Chrissy for ya. So when Jesse and Chrissy got paired up for the challenge, things didn't really go smoothly when Chrissy decided to give a few suggestions on what to cook. You see, Jesse wasn't really on board with her ideas, and Chrissy, she wasn't ready to back down. She has in her head what she wants to do. Maybe it was for the best. Maybe the suggestions weren't fitting. Come on, I can't be the crazy one here, right? Anyway, things just kept getting worse when Ramsey checked in, and Chrissy revealed a dish with both asparagus and beans as part of it. This left Ramsey slightly puzzled, as he found the combination absolutely unnecessary. So he questioned Jesse about it. You didn't know she was doing the green beans. I missed that part, I never. Ladies, are you together? Yeah, they were on the same team, but didn't even know what they were serving. But when it came down to making the crepes, they really put the down in downhill. Turns out, Chrissy didn't know how to make one. And nope, she was in no mood to learn. I'm not familiar with them. I, Jesse, I am not comfortable doing the crepes. Okay, so since when has being in a competition ever been about comfort? You gotta do what you're told. Or, you know, show that you've grown and developed? That's how it goes. Meanwhile, Jesse wasn't in a mood for her complaints either. Babe, you abandoned me on the lobster, so you gotta pick something you can cook. It was clear that Chrissy was shocked to hear someone actually talking back to her. She couldn't believe it. Her anger was evident, and she didn't try to hide it. Not one bit. Literally, I'm going to take this hot pan and smash it in her face. Chill out, Chrissy. We already know you're a bully. Openly admitting it is kind of a waste of time. I mean, straight up saying that you want to smash someone's face in is a bit much. We all get mad, but we don't go around talking about stuff like that so openly, you know? But then, in a fit of rage that you won't believe, this is what she did. Got to get out of this kitchen right now, or I am seriously going to go to jail today. That's right. She just gave up and left. Just like that. Apparently, she only took a five-minute cool-off break, but according to an interview, Graham claimed that she took a whole 20 minutes to get back to the station. In the meantime, poor Jessie was left to do all the work alone. 
When Chrissy finally came back, there wasn't much for her to do really, and the only thing left for her was trying to figure out how she was going to kick Jesse's ass in the pressure test. But the thing that really got under my skin about this whole situation unfolded when they went up to present their dish. Ramsey found the lamb fat wasn't properly seared. And apparently, Chrissy thought it was a really good idea to throw her opinion about it into the ring, too. The, the lamb was not cooked properly, in my opinion. Ramsey wasn't a fan of her butting in like that, and he made sure to call her out over it. Why do you always let other members in your team take over? And nope. He didn't stop there. Say nothing, but then throw them under the bus when it comes to taking responsibility. It was like Chrissy was allergic to even the concept of taking responsibility. Safe to say, because of her little tantrum, the team lost that night. And that's what she deserved after all that had happened. It's a shame Jesse had to get caught in the crossfire like that, though. But hey, let's keep things moving. When it comes to picking fights, Chrissy was far from the only one. But before I reveal more, why don't you take a moment and drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications to stay updated with my latest posts. And hey, did you check out the tab right here? You can become a member of the channel and stand a chance to win some cool perks all throughout the year. What's more, my channel's Discord server is the place to be. It's honestly the perfect platform to keep the discussion going. So don't forget to check it out. And with that, let's take a look at what happened during the Mystery Box Challenge of Episode 2, Season 5. Funnily enough, Elizabeth and Leslie got in a huge fight, and you won't believe why. So Elizabeth was working at her station when Ramsey decided to pop in and ask a question that was sure to cause some drama. Who's gonna screw up tonight? Man, Ramsey sure knows how to stir the pot. Oh, uh, no pun intended. But Elizabeth didn't hesitate to give an answer either. It looks like Elizabeth had some sort of problem with Leslie because she didn't even think a second before answering the question. And when Ramsey asked why him, her answer wasn't something you'd expect. Because he's, because <laughs> he, he, he likes to flap his jaws and, and not cook so much. So he talks too much talks and doesn't produce. Much. That's one hell of a reason, if I'm being honest. I mean, saying he's gonna fail not because of his skills, but because of his personality wasn't an appropriate excuse. I mean, it's a cooking show. Does it really matter if he talks too much? He's there to show his skill in the game, so aside from judging how well he cooks, nothing else should really be a concern. Unless he's bringing a really mean spirit to the table or something, which he wasn't really. Clearly, that wasn't how Elizabeth saw things, though. Of course, Leslie heard it all, and he wasn't putting up with the fact that he was being attacked for literally no reason. So how did he clap back? Take a look at this. I've never said anything to you, Elizabeth, never once. You wanna get ugly? Let's get ugly. Yeah, dude wasn't having it. Not for a second. Someone he had never even spoken to was just being a jerk for no reason. Now, who in their right mind would be okay with that, let alone let it slide? He kept going but so did she. You don't know where the hell I've been. You live in Malibu. She was trying to imply that because he lived in Malibu, he was clearly a stranger to struggles. But hey, just because you're bitter about your own life doesn't mean you have to judge others for their accomplishments. That's just pure jealousy right there. And Leslie, he wasn't gonna take it lightly. Ah. Last 10 seconds. Nine. Dude was spitting facts. Luxury doesn't come easy. If you're born poor, you've had to work hard to earn it, and if you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you still have to work hard to keep it. At least most of the time. Not talking about mega billionaires. Either way, you gotta work your ass off, and Leslie did just that. But Elizabeth's bitterness just kept coming. I worked so hard to get where I am. Obviously your wife works, and you don't. Okay, and since when did we start shaming men for being a stay-at-home husband? We don't shame women for doing the same, so, like, what gives? As long as he's not sitting on his hands, eating chips, and playing video games all day, what's the problem? Some people just don't get it, do they? Even if Leslie's wife is the one who works, I'm pretty sure Leslie has his own share of roles to play. How can you try to shame someone when you don't even know what goes on in their life? If you ask me, I think Leslie defended himself with a ton of class. One thing's for sure, the man doesn't tolerate unnecessary disrespect. To me about where I live, 
figure out how I got there. Earmuffs. I work. You want drama? I'll give it to you. When Ramsey noticed things were getting heated, he showed up right in the nick of time and reminded him how he should be the mature one since he's older and pull it back a bit. And that's exactly what he did. He apologized, like a decent person, and went on about his work. I mean, yeah, season 5 had some pretty interesting characters. But Elizabeth wasn't the only one who took the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. Astrid from season 1 was quite the character in her own right. During the second round of auditions, she was seen doing something so disgusting that it became a legit matter of concern. What was it, you ask? Well, take a look right here. Does she cook like that at home? That's right, those were literal food scraps just chilling on the floor everywhere, completely out of place. I'm pretty sure MasterChef provides each station with a trash can. Joe has proven as much time and time again. How hard was it really to actually use it? Even the contestants were appalled by her unsanitary working conditions. But not just them, Joe as well. And he wasted no time in letting her know. This is disgusting. This is not how you work in restaurants. Like, the whole situation was totally unacceptable. And he wasn't done yet. We're not going to tolerate disgusting working conditions. We have sanitary standards. This is dangerous, and I'm just not going to tolerate it. But hey, he wasn't wrong, for once. There's a certain standard you got to keep, especially on national television. I mean, what made her think it was completely OK to throw the scraps on the floor like that? And guess what? Before Joe left, he had one final blow to give. Because if you were in my kitchen, you'd be taking a taxi home. Wow. Absolutely right once again. I'm pretty damn sure this kind of behavior is completely unacceptable in a restaurant. Let alone your own home if you value living in a clean space. Either way, it can lead to major cross-contamination and who knows, someone might just slip and fall over the mess. I mean, under such working conditions, it's not just the customers. Even the kitchen staff can land in the hospital. But hey, at least she was mature enough to accept her mistake and do better. Not a lot of people on the show have done that. And definitely not this next contestant. So in episode 7 the season 5, the contestants were paired up by Courtney, the winner of the previous challenge. And Cutter was paired up with Dan to cook a surf and turf meal. But over in the pantry, they seem to have a little trouble communicating. Apparently, Dan refused to listen to Cutter's ideas, and what's more, he was still clueless about what veggies he needed to use. The guy's brain had completely shut down, as Cutter would like to say. As a result, when the time was up to pick pantry ingredients, both Cutter and Dan failed to get enough to cook their surf and turf, forcing them to cook an incomplete and underwhelming meal. And when Ramsey came to check in and see how things were going, he was quite concerned, seeing how things were between the two. Are we definitely on the same page? Guys, are we okay? Ramsey's concern compelled Cutter to lay it all out in the open. Cutter? No, I ain't okay. I ain't gonna lie. No, I ain't okay. Dan goes off on a wild tangent in the pantry, and by the time we got out of there, we're out of time. Yeah, Cutter was leaning on that mystery box skill set big time. But the judges are usually more understanding during those challenges, so when it was time for their dish to get judged, you can kind of guess how it must have gone. Uh, what in the f Ramsey's reaction was wild. The plate was practically empty. He couldn't believe that this was what they served him, especially with the Master Chef pantry being like three feet away. Was he wrong? Nope. Dan's slow decision making affected not only him, but Cutter too. Ramsey needed a justification for the disastrous dish, and he needed it now. And Cutter stepped forward to deliver it. Tell me I'll what say that exactly is. exactly what happened. Please. Go in the pantry. Please. He has an idea. I listened to him. Yeah. I told him I didn't like it. If you thought he was done, you've got another thing coming. I simply in... told you that neither one, they're both lean and they don't go together. We didn't get enough ingredients to really make anything work. Because you didn't know, have an idea. You didn't have anything real in what you wanted to do. Still, Ramsey wasn't satisfied with the excuse and said that they had filled up their baskets in the pantry, so they must have had something to work with. And honestly, I'm with Ramsey here. But Dan had a different story. By the time we hit our station, 
There was nothing we could do in terms of ingredients. We had what we had. Regardless of their lack of ingredients, Cutter insisted that the dish tasted pretty good. But Ramsey wasn't exactly on board with that opinion once he had a taste of it too. Even separate identities, it still doesn't work. That is possibly one of the worst dishes. That's gotta hurt. But hey, that's what you get for not thinking fast enough. Contestants just can't catch a break with the judges. Whether it's their behavior or their dish, they always seem to be getting on the judges' nerves. Much like this next contestant. So, in the 13th episode of season two, Susie was like super confident with her dish, thinking she had it in the bag, you know? But little did she know, things were about to go south real fast for her. Like, it was gonna be brutal. Why do I say that? Well, for starters, the dish straight up looked like someone took a dump on the plate. No joke. I mean, take a look at it and tell me I'm wrong. Seriously, get in the comments. I'm standing my ground here. Pork belly, uh, braised cabbage, and spetzel, as well as uh, a gravy. Ramsey totally didn't see that coming with the dish, but he decided to give it a shot anyway. Well, let me tell ya, he regretted that decision real quick. Like, you could pinpoint the exact moment he rethought all of his life's choices. Mm. Oh man, he totally flipped out. The dish wasn't even a proper dish, just a mishmash of spices and other garbage. I'm talking about a flavor explosion that's more explosion than flavor. Like, seriously, I'm over here remembering the time I tried to bomb for the first time and figuring that's how nasty it was. But back to Ramsey, he couldn't tolerate another bite of the garbage. And what he had to say about the dish was nowhere near nice. His words were just brutally honest. No sugar coating. Maybe we call it cayenne pepper coating. The worst sauce I've ever tasted in my entire life. Entire life? Now that's extreme. If he had just said on the show, it'd have still been better. But to say it was the worst sauce he had in his entire life, that just goes to show that this dish was next level nasty. It was so bad that he straight up called it dog food. But I mean, if I fed that to my dog, he'd probably die on the spot. And you best believe when Joe came up to taste the dish, he pretty much destroyed Susie's career. If there was any bit of it left, that is. It's called Master Chef, not Delusional Chef. And he went on and on and on. I will not even be able to taste the dishes that I taste after this because of you. It is awful. No doubt. If someone takes a bite of that dish, their taste buds are bound to shrivel up and die, screaming for help. But Joe was so disappointed that he wished she went home that night. Even if she didn't get the boot, you bet this memory's gonna be etched into her brain. Like, forever. She'll be replaying that epic fail in her mind, getting hit with flashbacks every time she's trying to go to sleep. But that aside, I've saved the best for last. In season 10, episode 19, things got crazy, but this time, not because of the contestant. Dorian presented her dish, and safe to say, she was confident and rightfully proud of it. Visually, the sausage looks hearty, and that wonderful bean stew underneath it, it's got dive in all over it. It looked beautiful for sure, and I'm not the only one to think that. The sausage itself is a wonderful texture. The flavor permeates the whole thing and it's a complete dish. Ramsey was completely in love with how the dish looked. It was perfect from all angles. It goes without saying, when Ramsey compliments your dish like that, it means it's a success. He wasn't the only one singing its praises though. The idea of the tomato and the beans, it's done in a refined manner. I love it, uh, it's delicious. Even before tasting the dish, they were in love with it, and that speaks volumes. But of course, Someone had to create some drama, and who better than Joe? Apparently, he had a problem with her dish. The garlic bread, I absolutely love. Mm. I'm glad you love it. Love the garlic yeah. bread. He didn't like the fact that the dish contained garlic bread, claiming it cheapened it. And you know what? Ramsey was in total disbelief. Yeah, I disagree. I think the toast cheapens the dish. No such thing as garlic bread in Italy. Then are the Italians serving it wrong, or do they just not know their own culture? 
Ramsay wasn't having it. Of course, Ramsay would know better. He's a real chef after all, unlike Joe here. So you don't serve garlic bread in your restaurants? No. Next, Ramsay tried to make Joe try it, but when he refused, you won't believe what Ramsay called him. Oh, I don't want any garlic bread. You're such a snob. Ramsay just straight up called Joe a snob to his face. No beating around the bush for him. Whether it's contestants or judges, if he sees something off, he's gonna call it out. Well, that's Ramsay for ya. So, can you think of more insane moments from the show? Make sure to drop your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you thought this video was wild, make sure to check out the next one right here. It's even better.